Bro, perspective, any other? I just want to ask the question again, because the last part of your question, do you want to, do you want to ask that again? Because did, are we answering the question or was there another part there? Yes, I answered the first bit of the question. The second question was that the pastors themselves do not train the congregation. Ah. Reason is because if they do train them, they're going to build up another church and yeah. take the congregation elsewhere. Yeah, sure. So that was the question, the second yeah. one. Which, which I, in a way, it's been <coughs> answered because then, you know, the pastor is obviously relying on the people more than God. Mm. So I guess my perspective here is we talk about father, father, we've been talking about father, father, uh, the word Abba, Abba is source, sustainer, yep. provider. Yep. And I think many times we get source confused with resource. Mm. We are all called to live off the Father who's source, but resource can look different. Whether it's ministry, uh, the way we know it, or a job or a business, everybody is supposed to be living off source. Mm. You know, sometimes people say, I live by faith. We're all supposed to be living by faith. Mm. It's not just a minister's job. If you have a business, it's also by faith because the business has yes. a bigger purpose than just earning money. Yep. You know, so it's interesting that Jesus, like, why does he say there are two masters? There are only two masters. There's God and Mammon. And Mammon's trying to be your God. And Mammon's not just money. Mammon is everything that comes with money. Safety, security, fame, glory. All of that is competing with God in our life. And we get to choose, you know. So the pattern of this world has trained us to rely on mammon for source and sustenance instead of father. And so if I'm going into ministry, whether I earn from people or I, I have my own business is irrelevant as long as source is source. As soon as source is not source anymore, I have now moved out of alignment. Yep. Right. So it, now it's going to be messy no matter what. You know? wow. Another interesting thing is we've turned callings into professions. So people just want to be a professional pastor, you know? Like I remember hearing about a ba local Baptist church package that he was getting. And I was like, man, I should go become a Baptist pastor. Like that's an amazing lifestyle, you know? He's getting a house, a car, he's getting a salary. I'm like, what's going on, you know? And so when you turn a calling into a profession, now source has been moved out of the way, you know? And, and that's an important lesson I think for all of us is that source is God and he will sustain you no matter what. Uh, but the mammon <coughs> conversation, and so COVID really exposed how many people rely on mammon. Yep. You know, so before Jesus says, seek first the kingdom and all these things will be added unto you, we must confront that you trust mammon more than me. Right? It's interesting what he says later. He says, you will love one and hate the other. You will be loyal to one and despise the other. And so there are many Christians, well-meaning Christians, who are loyal to mammon and they despise the call of God on their life because they can't source it. But we were never supposed to be source. We are resource. And we receive from source. So I think that's the most important part. You know, and who wants to be a pastor if you're not called to be one? It's the hardest thing ever. I who wants tell to tell you? <laughs> Every pastor would say amen. Like, oh, you know, absolutely. When you're called for it, you're graced for it. It's a different story. But when you're not, you know. Um, yeah, so hopefully I'm answering that question. The other thing is... I. Where do I go here? Kingdom purpose. I think it's important we talk about purpose, you know? There is a purpose for your life, and there is a purpose for your season. And so sometimes the purpose is not the economy, it's not the money, it's who you are becoming. Because God is always more interested in who you are becoming than what you're doing, you know, or what you're earning, or what you're having. So I remember when I started my fitness business, uh, my pastor also taught me that you, you live by faith, you know, in that sense that you, he never took a salary. But he had a multi-million dollar business. So I'm like, okay, I'll start a business because God led me into my business. But I assumed the reason for my business was to make me money. Mm. And so eight years in their business, it never crossed 100K. And I felt like a failure for so long. Till that season switched and God started revealing to me who I became in those eight years is still producing and now and will keep producing. And that was more important than the money that I made. Absolutely. So it's very important to understand purpose. See, one of the things I do is get people to pray dangerous prayers when they want to start trusting God. And a dangerous prayer you can pray is, Father, I give you full permission to break all my paradigms around money and father me into receiving from you only. That's a dangerous prayer. Because usually everything you trust in that is not God is going to fall. And so when I, when I got people to do this, at the beginning they'd lose some money, they'd lose something, and, you know, and, it's, ah, and God's giving you this opportunity. You want to switch your gas tank or no? 
COVID really exposed that everyone's gas tank was in the kingdom of this world. But Romans 12, 2 tells us to not be conformed to the pattern of this world. Because the pattern of this world is not your original intent, you know. So the purpose of the season is very important. And uh, you might go through a season where you're barely making enough, but in that you are becoming someone and you're going to produce for the rest of your life, you know. The other thing I want to say is that we were not designed to earn. That was not God's original intent. The earning came after the curse. There was no sweat of your brow and toiling the land. Everything was blessed. That's our design. So we weren't designed to earn. The pattern of this world has trained you to earn everything. Earn money, earn love, earn respect. <coughs> earn fame. And so we go down this hamster wheel trying to earn all the time. You know? So when we start learning to live from Father who gives love, who gives before we can give anything back. You only love him because he loved you first. If he didn't love you first, you have no love to give him. So that earning mentality, in this season especially, God is pulling us out of this stuff. You know, the nine to five uh, mentality, that's not a heavenly mentality. That wasn't originated in heaven. That's an earthly construct. A week day and a week end, that's not a heavenly construct. Heaven is outside of time. So when, God, when you want to come out of this being sourced by the earth, all of these paradigms, God will start challenging them. You know, so uh, I hope that made sense. You weren't designed to earn, but you were designed to be part of an ecosystem of heaven. So I love the concept of giving, giving and receiving. That's part of how God created everything. Right now, I am breathing out and I am giving carbon dioxide to a tree. That tree is taking what I'm giving and it's giving me back oxygen ecosystem. There was a tide in the ocean that's coming in and it's going out, right? If it only came in, we would flood. If it only went out, we would dry up. Are you with me? There is an ecosystem and we must learn how to give and receive both the same way. So one thing I like to say is if you can give at the same speed as you can receive, you're in a good place. Some people struggle to receive, but they can give, which means they think that they are the source. So they don't want to receive. Some people only receive, don't know how to give, which means, again, they think they're the source, so they try and hold it for themselves. But when you learn how to live in the ecosystem of heaven, your father can start to open up jurisdiction for you, you know? Does that, does that make sense? So we were called to live of his goodness, his nature, his character, not of our ability, our works, our effort. Uh, did God know that COVID was going to happen? Yeah, he did. Did he know all this stuff was going to go? Yeah, he did. Did he have a plan for you? Yes, he did. So in January 2020, the Lord says to me, shut my fitness business down, you know? And my fitness business was the income for my whole family, my wife, my three children. So I shut it down and then COVID came. Now, if I didn't shut it down then, I would have been trying to push my business in the middle of COVID and I would have gone anyway. But as I shift out of there, he pulls me online and he took me into a new cycle, a new economy, a new uh, way of making money that's way more than my fitness business, you know? Because God always has a plan for you. A good father always does. Are you with me? Yeah. So the other thing I want to say is this marketplace conversation, right? Sacred, secular. Secular, if you keep di diving into that word, secular means no God, without God. But David said, even if I make my bed in the depths of Sheol, you are with me. So where are you going without God? There is no secular, right? So this marketplace conversation is becoming very blurry now because some people's marketplace is their bedroom and their Zoom call now. Some people's marketplace is their laptop and it's going everywhere they go, you know? And so I think everything's changing. We're learning how to be in the world, but not of the world, to, to release another kingdom. Uh, last couple of things I want to say. Irrelevancy, like where um, you know, Tyra was talking about being irrelevant. The reason even that's a conversation is because of the sacred-secular divide that was created. So for example, if people chose ministry, for some reason they thought they should ignore the world. You know? And that's why all this irrelevancy. If you're in the kingdom, you are never irrelevant. You will never be irrelevant because you will always have in time and a season, something to, to give, you know? And the last thing I want to say is, I ran this workshop called Sparrows and Lilies, you know, in Matthew 6. He talks about mammon, and, and then he goes into these sparrows and lilies, and he starts to say, why do you worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear? Look at the sparrow. You know, in New Zealand, every mall, every restaurant, somehow a little sparrow will get in there, and it's eating whatever it wants and it doesn't have a bank account, doesn't have a crypto wallet, doesn't have an investment portfolio, right? It's got nothing. But this sparrow is eating what it wants, total reliance on Abba. But then Jesus compares our provision 
to a lily, and then he compares the lily to Solomon's splendor. So I just want to break this over. Solomon lived in a time where he was so wealthy, they put silver on the side of the road because silver didn't have as much value. There's so much wealth in the ecosystem of the nation. And he compares a lily to Solomon, and he says the splendor of this lily is much more than Solomon. So there is an abundance and extravagance that God operates in that our poverty mindset, our poverty thinking and religion has robbed us of. That's why we read about the apostles and we automatically assume they were poor, they were broke, they were begging. I read nowhere of begging. I read nowhere where Jesus was begging. In fact, Jesus, you know, there's a guy named Peter Daniels. He did some research on some of the finances. And uh, when Jesus was born, all these, these uh, it wasn't three wise men. It was a whole, it was magi that came to him, recognized him, and they bought gifts. And the value of those gifts were in the hundreds of millions. It wasn't $10, it was that's how Joseph, Mary, and Jesus survived three years running away. They were sustained, they were provided for. The reason the Bible doesn't major on you having money is because it's not your source, it's your slave. Money is supposed to be your servant. It is supposed to serve you. Sadly, the pattern of this world has made us work 40, 50 hours toiling to earn this thing that was created to be our servant. You know, so, so Jesus had so much money that Judas was stealing money from the treasury and nobody knew. If he only had $20 and he took 10, everybody would know. And then Peter would have got Judas. <laughs> Peter would have done something to Judas. So we got to understand the reason they're not majoring on this is because that's a minor detail. In the world, it's major. But in, in the context of kingdom, your money, your material wealth is, is minor. It's serving a greater purpose, you know. So the sparrows and lilies, they're learning how to, re they know how to receive from Father, and God is inviting you to that place where you can receive everything you need from your good Father. The last thing I just want to confront about that, when we read, seek first the kingdom and all these things shall be added unto you, right? We think about needs. My God shall supply all your needs. We think need is budget. You understand? Like, we're kind of taught that. So if you need a car, you think God's going to send you a third-hand Toyota Corolla that's barely working, but it's a provision of God. You know? We think He functions like that. So I want to challenge that paradigm, right? If I speak to a kid who lives in the slums, whose dad is working for a dollar a day, and they're, they're all eating one bowl of rice once a day, and I come to that kid and I say to him, hey, uh, God will supply your needs. He's going to think the need is what? A bit more rice. Maybe two bowls of rice. That's his thinking. But if I spoke to a prince, a prince of this nation, I said to him, God's going to supply your need. His thinking about what I need is a whole new dimension. Because the prince is understanding life in a different way. So if you are a child of the creator of everything that has ever existed, what should your need definition be? Are you with me? Wow. And so we don't understand that we've pre-patterned ourselves in an other dimension and we're trying to get his goodness and his glory to come into this lesser dimension. And the whole time he's like, hey, I sent my son to die for you. I tore the veil to come out of that. Come into the real dimension where you're going to live from something else. And you'll be unstoppable. Man. Could, I, could I throw something in there? Please. Because once you touch mammon, I have a book, you know about it, uh, and then I'm believing God will be done. It's called Unmasking Mammon. And uh, I come from a continent that lives in an oxymoron. Okay? Um, and I got tired of everybody talking about how much material wealth is in Africa you know, compared to the level of poverty in Africa. And so um, I spoke in a conference in Liberia and I said, the Bible says that the lazy man that does not roast what he hunts. You know, so, and, and that's actually stupid because it takes more effort to hunt than to roast. And that basically meant that the biggest problem in Africa is value addition, not lack of material. But la value addition requires effort, it requires energy, it requires thinking, it requires reasoning. But what has kept us there is the principle of poverty. And um, in, in Unmasking Mammon, some of the things I pull is I say, you know, it's very funny how God talks about poverty from, the, from where you're saying. In the Old Testament, it says, if your brother becomes poor. Now, that's a strange statement. It says if. It's not expected. If your brother becomes poor, it doesn't say give to him. It says restore him. Well, that's huge. Restoring is a huge process. 
Because basically God is saying, in the commonwealth of the kingdom, there shouldn't be poverty. But if your brother does become, notice it's a process, becomes poor, then restore him. So what have we taught in church? Give to him, charity. We haven't taught restore him because that's responsibility. It means empower, it means encourage, it means resource, it means all sorts of things to bring him back to it. But the thing that caught me in scripture, and my wife likes joking about this, she says, you know, the funniest thing about the Bible is that this, we as believers, whenever we have nothing, we offer God everything. So Lord, I give you my all. Because you know you have got absolutely nothing. You know, but the minute we've got stuff, then we become very careful about those kind of statements. You, you know, and, and the, the principle is this, that I noticed in scripture, and I'm still hoping I'm wrong, that God never addresses the poor. Nowhere in the Bible does he speak to the poor. He speaks to people about the poor. He says, if there is poor among you, take care of them. If there is poor, in other words, his reference point is, that's an anomaly. And we should correct it as soon as we can. That's really the principle we should operate by. But you can't do that if mammon has bound you. Mm. Because the, the, the word love, and he's put it very well, you will love one and despise. The, the, first, the, the Greek word for and is simultaneous. It means you automatically despise one by loving the other. Wow. It doesn't mean you have a choice. Mm. It just means if your heart is here, it's not there. Yeah. Yeah. And if it's there, it's not here. Period. There's no thinking through this. Yeah. And so the word love is trust. It means if you trust one, you despise the other. And how does it, how do you showcase the trust? The same Matthew 6 talks about, do not worry. Mm. Worry is one of the first symptoms of distrust. Mm. It's the proof that you don't trust God. Mm. And that you trust money because what causes you to worry is not the absence of God. It's the absence of money. So who do you trust? And so that's the weight of where we need to go with this. If we trusted God, who is always with us, I mean, we both say God is omnipresent, God is here, God is everywhere, but when money is missing, we are panicking. But God's right here. So what does that tell you where our trust lies? And that's what we must get past. To as long as I'm with him, as Papa said, then money is going to follow. That's it. Wow, that, that is so good.